Chapter 2 Inez, Kentucky was first settled by James Ward in 1810. Initially, Inez was named Armetta Ward's Bottom. This community was made the seat of Martin County in 1873, replacing the earlier court at Warfield. Upon the occasion, J.M. Stepp renamed the area Eden after the biblical garden. Stepp saw the place as beautifully decorated with trees, grass, and fresh clean air. This is what God's Eden looked like to him. He liked to think he never imagined his Eden would be contaminated by one of the most violent, brutal prisons ever known to man. Had he been able to see in the future, in the presence of Satan himself, he might have named the place humanity's hell. Eden needed a new name. There was already a post office named Eden. The local postmaster was obliged to rename his Eden, Inez, on June 23, 1874. The name Inez is usually held to have been derived from that of Inez Frank, the daughter of Louisa's postmaster in neighboring Lawrence County. Little did Inez Frank know back in the 1800s that her name would forever be intertwined with another name, Sandy, that it would be coupled with felons, rape, robbery, violence, and even murder. President Lyndon Johnson visited Inez, Kentucky in 1964. While Inez's population of under 1,000 poverty-stricken inhabitants looked on, President Johnson landed a helicopter with his party at an abandoned miniature golf course to promote the war on poverty. At that time, the poverty rate in this coal mining area was greater than 60%. Many years after President Johnson landed in Inez, Kentucky, the city was gifted with a prison. With it came jobs. 306 acres of land were set aside to build this high-security prison. The secure area that houses 1,253 inmates, on average, only compromises 26 acres of that land. An additional 69 inmates are housed at the minimum security camp, although that area is equipped to hold up to 128 convicted felons. Inmates housed at the camp provide the United States prison with a vital labor force. Big Sandy sprawls over these 306 acres, most of it rocky hillside. The main institution is secured by perimeter fences topped in razor wire multiple large armed observation and gun towers, roving patrols, and electronic detection systems. Inside is a colony of desperate, and in most cases, lonely souls. Not just the prisoners, staff too. Prison is a two-sided world. It doesn't matter who you are, prisoner or staff, no one can walk through the doors of USP Big Sandy and leave unaffected. No one. Chapter 3 My heart rate increases, but I try to remain calm. I'm projecting cool hand Luke himself. The neglected feeling increases, though, with each biting step. I feel like the shackles are designed to bite into your ankles when you move. We are led to the R&D department. A crowd of staff are milling around a long countertop, and we are ushered into a small holding cell that smells like urine. All 29 of us are jammed into a cell that would normally hold no more than 10 men. The buzzing from the overhead fluorescent lights vibrate my eardrums. The walls seem to be caving in on me. Claustrophobic or not, it is not a good feeling being cramped up with 28 other men in a small cinder block bunker. Before long, we are given clipboards, small pencils, and forms to fill out. It seems as if this is the last part of losing my life. Every time I sign my signature to a form, I feel like my John Hancock is another way of me saying goodbye to the real world. The last form gives permission to the staff to open and read all incoming mail. The last part informs me that any mail I send out cannot be sealed by me. It must be read, inspected, then sealed by a correctional officer. The door of the holding cell is unlocked, so the stench has an escape route. Marks 055, an officer calls out. Right here. Come with me. I am back in one of the cattle stalls for the routine, all-inclusive strip searches that come with leaving or entering a new prison. Once naked, I am ordered to bend over and spread my ass cheeks. Again, I find myself mad enough to pluck a chicken with my teeth. For me, there is nothing more humiliating than being strip-searched by another man. The spread in part only intensifies the humiliation. The anger rises like bile in my throat. Anger is the one thing that I hold on to. Like many prisoners, it feels like the only thing that reminds me that I am still normal. The intake process is long. Fingerprinting, photos, medical evaluations, and a new monkey suit to tide us over until we make it to the laundry tomorrow. Elastic waist khaki pants, brown shirt, and orange slip-on shoes are issued to us. Once dressed, we are put back in our holding cell. Finally, the food arrives. I can feel my stomach touching my back. Brown paper bags containing one cheese sandwich, one bologna sandwich, and a small container of warm milk. I have been eating bologna sandwiches for days now. 
I harbor some small hope that the food will get better. Someone calls my name and number again. I am led to a small room for a security interview conducted by the captain, lieutenant, and a special investigation services, SIS officer. The captain speaks first. Take a seat, Marks. Where are you from, son? The lieutenant belts out. First time in the feds, I see, the captain says, and then lets out a loud whistle. This cracker has a boatload of time. Forty fucking years. This cracker has a boatload of time. Forty fucking years. His eyebrows arch up as he looks over at the SIS officer. What the fuck did you do? The SIS officer asks with a surprised expression on his face. Crack cocaine case is my only response. Did someone die? Nah, man. They gave me five years for a 12-gauge hunting rifle, 25 years for a 22 rifle, and 10 years for 50 grams of crack. That's that 924C stacking shit, right? Yeah, that's it. They have some dude from Utah all over the internet for that shit. Wally or something. Well, then Angelos, I ask? Yeah, man, that's him. I read his story. They might change that shit. Then what would you have? Fifteen years. What happened on that bus? Asked the captain. Nothing. Well, they told us you had a smart mouth. You're starting over here. Don't worry about it. All right. I appreciate that. Well, you might not. But anyway, did you rat on anyone? Nah, man. Never assisted law enforcement in any way? Rape kids? Fuck no, man. What kind of question is that? Mandatory question, son. Now let's not get that mouth going. New start, all right? The heavy set lieutenant says as he coughs into his hand. Well, you should make it here, at least for a little while, the captain chimes in with a small snicker. He clears his throat. Well, conduct yourself like a man in here, like a convict. Am I done here? Possibly. As I begin to rise, the captain tells me to sit back down. Look, I don't know what you really did to get a 40-year sentence, but you seem semi-intelligent. This is a serious place. Do you understand that? Actually, I do. Well, you don't come across like a typical convict. Do yourself a favor. Don't get no tattoos on your face and get a knife because you're going to need one. That is the best advice I can give you. Thanks, I say, fully understanding that the meeting is over. But for some reason, I cannot bring myself to my feet. All three men are staring at me. I wonder what they are really thinking. Have they seen other men this nervous? A nervousness that grips one's soul so deep that the body's mechanisms will not respond to the signals from the brain? I shake it off. Do you have anything else for me? No, send the next guy in. My legs finally find themselves. I grip the hard white plastic chair arms. Rising to my feet, I find just enough courage to move forward. Forward to that destiny that no man should have to endure. My hand grabs for the door, and as it swings open, I hear the three men behind me chuckle. Likely, they have played this part over and over for many years before me with similar men. Twenty-eight men are still bottled up in the holding cell. As I make my way back there, my heart races with fear and a sick sense of excitement. Thoughts are swirling through my mind like an Oklahoma tornado. Is this the feds? The federal government? Did this guy just tell me to get a knife? For a minute, I think I must have heard him wrong, that my mind is playing tricks on me, like that Ghetto Boys song. I replay the conversation over and over in my head, hoping I am wrong. The sad truth is, I have to get a knife because that's exactly what the captain said. My mind is not playing tricks on me, and it breaks another piece of my being inside. I cannot imagine what it would be like to be stabbed. The thought overwhelms me with fear. I guess it's a matter of stab or be stabbed. All the stories I heard about Big Sandy are slowly beginning to manifest themselves. Why are they stabbing each other? How are they getting knives? I know in an instant that I don't want to be here for one minute without one. As the captain suggested, that's my first priority. I would rather be caught with a prison shank than without one by some deranged felon bent on killing me for no apparent reason. The art of prison knife making is priority number one on my agenda list. Prior to walking through the doors of doom, I would never have imagined a federal corrections officer, let alone a captain in a high position of authority, instructing me to get a knife. My insides shake with anxiety from my stomach to my brain. How I ever put myself in this position, I will never truly understand. Prison will not be easy. Every day of my life behind these concrete walls will turn into a struggle just to survive. When I woke up in Youngstown, Ohio, and looked into that mirror of despair, I told myself I was going to be all right no matter what happened. I no longer know if that is the truth. My moment of solitude is interrupted when I hear a voice close to me say, What did they say, bro? A bald-headed white guy covered in tattoos is talking to me. Nothing much. They said I was cool for the yard, 
told me to get a knife, then sent me back in here. The white guy smiles, extending his hand. They call me Shamrock, bro. This shit is real over here. It's party time in Kentucky, bro. I smile back sarcastically while I examine Shamrock, quickly assessing that he is a babbling idiot. I wish he would find someone else to talk to. I take issue with him calling me bro. I'm not his bro or brother. The thought of pulverizing him here now flirts with my conscience. It's been on my mind from the first hour of the bus ride. For a brief moment, I fantasize about what his head would look like if my hand crashed into his jaw just to quiet him for the rest of the day. I stare at the tattoo across his neck. Shamrock. It paints a clear target. If struck, it would fold all 150 pounds of him. In my mind, I'm querying whether if I hit him hard enough, one or more of his 60 or so tattoos would fall off. Since the bus ride, his mouth has been running like a well-oiled machine. His mission, I guess, was to make new guys think he was some tough prison gladiator built for battle. I easily see through the facade, and for a split second, I have empathy for him, knowing that his phony mask he is wearing is his own defense mechanism for what Big Sandy has in store for each of us. Shamrock is called out for his security interview, giving us a break from his counterfeit prison war stories. Within minutes, he is back, to our collective disappointment. I was secretly hoping he would vanish or be gone for at least 20 minutes. Damn, he shouts. The assholes are locking me up. He says it so everyone can hear him. How come, I ask, curious. They got me down as a skinhead, said my people don't walk here, so I gotta go to the shoe. With him having all the shamrocks tattooed on his body, he is supposed to be the lucky one. But for now, luck has found me. My lips form a smile as things begin to register. I won't be seeing this asshole any longer. Finally, this annoying freak with the bro reference will no longer be a part of my life. There is a knock on the window. The SIS officer from earlier points at Shamrock, then curls his finger in a come-here gesture. The door opens and the SIS officer tells a correctional officer to put Shamrock in a cell by himself. The door opens and the SIS officer tells a correctional officer to put Shamrock in a single cell by himself. As Shamrock walks out the door, the captain appears. Lock him up. Cell alone. Wreck alone. He's PCing. Shamrock knows we all heard the captain. He walks towards the single cell with his head down. A defeated dog after a hard-fought battle. Kelly, the guy who sat in front of me on the bus, slides close. That Shamrock, he's a punk. Checked in. Faking like he was a gangster. Man, he's soft, Kelly says with a grin. Why did he check in? Man, I came with him from Terre Haute, USP. One of his skinhead brothers got jumped on. He ran and didn't help the dude. That's why he can't walk here. He's got brothers on this yard. If he came out, they would kill him. Where is he from? Wisconsin. I don't know about you, but I never met no tough guys from Wisconsin. Except the dudes who play for the Packers. Have you? Nah, not really, I say. We both laugh loudly. That whole bus ride with his prison stories was a joke. He knows that once we hit the yard, I would have exposed his ass. Once a check-in, always a check-in. He's going to be in PC for the rest of his bid. For that shit at Terre Haute? That, and there's some paperwork on him that he's a snitch. He did some legal work for someone and then wrote the dude's prosecutor. He can't go nowhere, bro. Kelly calling me bro does not anger me the way it did when Shamrock used the reference. Checking in is a mortal prison sin that is equivalent to snitching. Such a sin follows you from prison to prison. If caught... There's always some form of punishment to be paid for one's trespass. The penalty of such sin is atonement by one's own blood. The debt in prison can never be fully paid, but always collected when the opportunity presents itself. Shamrock is truly hit for the rest of his bid. Luck may never find him, no matter how many shamrocks he has tattooed on his skin. Checking in means you tell staff you're not safe. That comes with telling on someone or a group of people. Most times, staff will not let someone check in unless they name someone. Such drastic actions come with severe consequences. Consequences for people like Shamrock that will follow them for years to come. The door swings open, and a booming voice echoes off the walls. All right, men, grab a mattress and a bedroll as you exit the cell. It's time to enter the house of pain, a uniformed guard yells out. Our names are yelled out along with a housing unit assignment, and we are led out into a long hallway. The ground is hard concrete with a glistening shine. The long hallway is vacant except for us, the new inhabitants of this proclaimed house of pain. The smell is distinctly clean. Everywhere is spotless. When we bend the corner, there is a larger metal detector and sliding jail bars that open and close both manually and electronically 
by whomever is manning the control booth. An old wall phone dangles upside down by its curly cord, a symbol of Big Sandy's defunct communication system. As we walk on, I hear a screaming noise being emitted from a handheld radio strapped to the lead officer's waist belt. My ears strain to hear. The sound of hard boots slaps the shiny concrete in rapid succession. All available units respond to the North Yard immediately. Fight in progress. Possible weapons. Oh shit, I think to myself. Officers are streaming past us, keys jangling on their belts. Get on the wall, men, the officer barks out. So I find my way to the wall, dropping my mattress and bedroll in the process. The wall routine is to make a clear path so officers can respond to the many emergencies I am sure grip this prison like a death vice. Within minutes, a heavy-set white guy is raced down the hall on a stretcher. His face is a mutilated, bloody mess. I quickly understand that this is the party that Shamrock was talking about earlier. Within hours of my arrival, the party has already started. But it's simply not my kind of party. For a fleeting moment, I think to myself, I should have done what Shamrock did. At least I would be safe. Suppressing this thought comes easy, knowing if I did that, I could never enter the general population here or at any other prison. One thing I can never do is, is check in. It would make for a rough 40 years. After being against the wall face first for over 10 minutes, we are pointed in the direction of the units we are to be housed in. Again, I feel like my legs do not want to move. Somehow, they do, and I march on to A4 housing unit. By the luck of the draw, I'm ordered to the same unit as Kelly. Three young, white convicts are walking toward us, handcuffed behind their backs with a six-officer escort. One of their eyes meets mine. He nods his head at me as if he recognizes me. I nod back as a sign of respect. My heavy mattress rests on my shoulder. These are the three men who recently wreaked havoc in the North Yard on the man now in the prison infirmary. I would later learn that the man's name is Skinner. His transgression was he tried to manipulate a 19-year-old white kid into performing oral sex on him. The 19-year-old went to the prison shot callers for help. Once he relayed the script, a hit on Skinner was sanctioned. In the white prison community, homosexual predators are not tolerated. Savage beatings are always inflicted as a form of deterrence. Look, Chad, you're new to this shit, Kelly sighs. So, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to teach you the ropes, bro. I've been down 10 years, in some serious places. So I know what the fuck goes on in here. What the hell is it with this bro word in prison, I think to myself. I just came from Terre Haute with that lame shamrock, and it was popping, bro. I know you're nervous. We all are. But you're going to be all right, man. For real. Trust me. Kelly finishes with a smile and a handshake. He can recognize my nervousness. I hope so, I respond. Listen, bro. Stick with your own in here, and don't fuck with niggers. I look around instantly, not believing what just came out of Kelly's mouth. The N-word. The majority of this place's population is blacks. Seeing my reaction, he chuckles. Aw, man, don't get bent out of shape over that. To them, we're honkies, crackers, white devils, and all kinds of shit. They call us what they want, we call them what we want. They know what they are. Again, I am stunned by his words. Whispering, I say, chill, man. If they hear you talk like that, they'll kill both of us. Kelly's eyes light up. That's why we have to get some knives ASAP, bro. Listen, Chad, this is prison, so I don't usually do this, but I'm going to treat you like a little brother and basically teach you how things work in the feds until you get the hang of this prison shit. That's cool with me, I answer with relief. Basic rules around here, man. First, stay away from drugs. Selling, using, whatever. It always leads to problems. The same goes for gambling. Don't mess with no homos. Stay away from gang dudes. And just to be politically correct for you, stay away from the African Americans. You're from New York, so don't start thinking you're an African American. That can get you in trouble in here. He laughs with his delivery. You get in a gang in here, all you're looking for is a problem. Be your own man, bro. And hopefully, one of these honkies in here will hit us off with a couple of knives. Man, I'm not trying to stab no one for real. Well, I don't want to be in prison either, but guess what? I'm here, and I'm trying to make it home. Ain't no one killing me in here. A knife is like an American Express card around here, bro. Never leave home without one. I guess it is what it is, right? As we get to the top of the stairs, I peer through the small window of the door. You're going to be all right, Chad. Trust me on this. And remember, you're a honky. Honkies rumble, crackers crumble. What are you? A honky, I guess, I say with a smile, wondering where Kelly ever drummed up a saying like that. 
Maybe from his days growing up in Ohio. Who knows? Again, I peer through the window in the door. The aperture is about five inches wide and 30 inches long. I see a stream of men yelling, playing cards, and others watching television. Hidden in my pants, my knees literally shake. I feel the bile well up and a slight burning in my throat. Kelly slaps me on the back, jarring me back to reality. He reaches for a large, black button to the right of the door, and a loud buzzing noise screeches out. Everyone inside looks towards the door. I step back from the window, wondering what is in store for me inside. 